All right, you ready for this? I want to talk to you today about the timing of faith. The timing of faith. There is a time to believe, and I want to show it to you today. Actually, I want Jesus to show it to you today. But I'd like us all to read Mark 11, 22 through 24. Mark 11, 22 through 24. I'm going to read from the New King James Version. If you don't have the New King James, that's all right. There are a lot of good versions. But just for the sake of us reading aloud, if you'll follow along on the screen so we can all read the same words, we'd appreciate that. Everybody together. And and let's not read this like this is the newspaper or some novel or something on Facebook. Let's read this like something on Instagram. No, I'm just kidding you. Let's let's read this as if this is the word of God. Amen? Come on. Ready? This is Jesus teaching us, but let's read. Mark 11, 22 to 24, loudly and together, let's read. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Now, we're going to focus on verse 24. We focused a lot on verse 23 for the last several months. Whoever says to the mountain, be removed and be cast in the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have Whatever he says. You ever notice how Jesus is absolute? He will have. Not might have, could have, should have. Sometimes, no. He will have whatever he says. Jesus speaks in such a way about prayer and the things of God that is different than most anybody will listen to. Ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. Well, either he's a liar or there's something we need to understand that he's explaining. And it's the second. And that is, Jesus is saying, I know the Father. Listen to me. He wants to answer your prayers. Let me teach you how to pray prayers that he answers and he will answer you. And that's what's happening. Jesus is teaching us. In fact, in this focus on Mark 11, 24, We're on a little series called Get Prayers Answered. Get Prayers Answered. Did you know if you can get your prayers answered, your whole life is different? You are an uncommon human being. If you can get your prayers answered, you're you're totally different than the average human being in this world. Isn't that right? Why? Because you can pray and the supernatural power of God is doing things for you when everybody else, they're they're on their own to figure it out. They're, They're into working hard or being at the right place and at the right time or it's who you know right but not you no you go straight to the creator of heaven and earth and you pray and he responds boy you're in a different world this is what jesus is saying is i want you to be in a different world how many of you know when jesus came to the earth as a human being he prayed then the bible say he often withdrew himself to pray and how many of you know his prayers were being answered And that's why we want to keep reading about his life, because his life was uncommon. The supernatural was happening in his life. And then he trained these disciples, these apostles, and then we want to read the book of Acts. Why? Because it was happening with them too. It wasn't just Jesus. He trained them to do it. Now he's training us. I want you to live this kind of uncommon life where you pray and Father responds to you and you are examples of me. You're showing the world that they too can come and be saved through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, be forgiven from their sins, have access to God the Father, and get their prayers answered. Isn't that right? But it's not just a message, it's an example. So that's why Jesus is teaching us, I need to show you that you can get your prayers answered. We should not be like ordinary people. We should be walking in supernatural things. Isn't that right? I'm not talking about like the Marvel heroes. I'm talking where we have all this power within ourselves, or all that kind of stuff. That's all fantasy stuff. We're talking about being connected to the holy creator who is, has unlimited power. But when we pray, when we speak, his power is released into this earth. 
And Jesus is saying, this is not fantasy, this is reality. And it's available. And it's available to little old you, too. And so Jesus is coming to convince us, you're not disqualified. You are not disqualified. Well, I've sinned a lot. Oh, he said, I took care of that. I paid for all of your sins. Well, I've made some mistakes. Forget those things which are behind. They're all washed under the blood of Jesus. Isn't that right? Well, I just don't speak so well. That's okay. That's okay. You don't have to speak well. You pray, God responds. Isn't that right? You, you say to the mountain, be removed. It'll move. How many of you know, if mountains are moving, supernatural things are happening in your life, people don't care how you talk. They just want to know, how'd you do that? Isn't that right? How'd you do that? See, and this is what Jesus is doing. He's saying, you're not to be like everybody else. You're with me. And you have the same results that I have. John 14, 12, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he shall do also, and greater works than these will he do because I go to my Father. So let's focus on this 24th verse now. Jesus said, therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Listen again. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, watch this, and you will have them. Not might have them, not could have them, not most of the time have them, not sometimes have them. What? You will have them. Isn't that what he said? You will have them. If you do what I say, you will have them. If you do what I say, you will have them. Okay, let's find out what he said. Okay, therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask, now let's focus on this right here. When you pray, believe. When you pray, believe. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe. When you pray, believe. Say that with me. When you pray, believe. Say it again. When you pray, believe. Pop quiz. When do you need to believe? When you pray. When you pray. When you pray, when you pray believe that you receive them. When you pray, believe that you receive them. You can't wait till you receive it to believe. Anybody can believe once they get it. Isn't that right? Jesus is saying, no, here's the key. Believe it right when you pray. Believe it as if it's a done deal right when you pray. Whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe. When you pray, believe. When you pray, we're talking about the timing of faith. This is how you get prayers answered. When you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. When you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. Let me read it out of the New American Standard. This is a very accurate translation. Jesus said, therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be granted to you. Believe that you have received them, and they will be granted to you. So Jesus is acknowledging the granting is going to happen in the future. It hasn't happened yet, right? Believe that you have received them, and they will be in the future granted to you. Well, how, how can you believe that you have received them if they're not going to be granted to you in the future? Faith. This is how. Let me show you how simple this is. This is really not complicated. Say, say we're in a room, and you're talking to somebody, and say, oh, man, I lost my car. Okay, and I've, I've used this before, but just think about it. I lost my car. I, 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 I don't have a car. I need a car. I'm riding a skateboard around town or whatever, right? I'm, I'm taking the bus, but I need a car. I need a car. And I overhear you, and I, I say, oh, you need a car? Listen, my wife and I have an extra car. Oh, yeah, I'll be happy to give it to you. Listen, after church, meet us outside. Meet us right outside the door, and, and I'll come over there and give you the keys and sign it over to you. Okay? You could believe that you receive it right then. And if you believe that you receive it right then, here's what you'll do. After the service, you'll go out there, and there you'll be, standing there smiling. Somebody say, what are you smiling about? Oh, I got a car. I got a car. And they'll say, well, where is it? No, no, I, I, it's not here yet, but, but well, well, do you still need a car? No, no, I got one. See, you're smiling, you're happy, you're excited, but you didn't get it yet. But you believe that you receive it. Can you see that? You believe that you receive it. So somebody says, yeah, well, maybe you should go and take a loan out and just make some payments. You say, no, no, I don't need to. No, no, I got it. I got it. Well, where is it? Well, it's not here yet. But 
it's, it's coming. And I'm ex- already excited about it. Can you see that? So there's a gap between believe when you pray, believe that you receive it, and you will have it. There's a gap between that. Right? So Jesus is acknowledging that there's a gap. See, some people that start to learn faith, they, they get confused about this, then they confuse others. And they think that Jesus is saying, no, believe that it's already manifested, and then talk like that and declare it to other people. And so you're trying to explain them, and they say, yeah, I got a car. Where is it? I have it. Well, where is it? I have it. Oh, you mean you're going to get it? No, 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 I'm not going to get it. I already have it. Well, where is it? Well, I have it. I have it. And now we're all confused. Like, dude, what did you smoke this morning, right? <laughs> I, I, I'm not tracking with you. Jesus is not trying to deceive people into believing something that's not true. But Jesus is telling us, you need to believe that you receive it when you pray, and it will happen in the future. But there's going to be a gap between when you're believing that you receive it You get excited about it. You're not worried about it anymore because you believe. But then in the future, it happens. Now, I don't know about you, but that gap, I like it to be really short. Anybody else? In fact, my favorite is very short, even instantaneous. Anybody like that? I like that. But that's not the way it always happens. Right? There's a gap. And don't think that the length of gap necessarily has to do with how much faith you have. That's not always true. Sometimes it is, but sometimes not. For example, the Bible talks about someone called the father of faith. Who is it? Abraham. And guess what? The primary promise that God gave to Abraham is you're going to have children like the sands of the sea and like the stars of heaven through a son that comes through your barren wife, Isaac. Isn't that right? And guess what? It took 25 years for Isaac to show up. And God says, he's the father of faith. So all of you that have been waiting a long time, if you're still in faith, still believing, still smiling about it, thanking God, you're a hero. The delay does not mean that you should be discouraged or that we're discouraged for you. Uh Uh-uh. Oh, no, you're a hero. In fact, next week we're going to talk about persistent faith, otherwise known as patience. Persistent faith. We'll let Jesus teach us that next week. But, oh, we're talking today about the timing of faith. See? Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have it. But don't get confused that you already have it. No, you believe that you receive, but you don't yet have it yet. It's sometimes simpler to talk about it with sickness. Say somebody's got a, you know, they get, get a cold or a cough. <coughs> And somebody says, you got a cough? No, no, I'm healed. <laughs> by his stripes, I'm healed. By his stripes, I'm healed. You know, 1 Peter 2, 24, by whose stripes you were healed. I was healed. <laughs> <laughs> but, you, but you still have a cough. No, 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 we don't. No, we don't. No, we don't. Well, yes, you do. Yes, you do. You're choking all over us. Isn't that right? See, Jesus is not trying to say, to convince everybody that you've already received the manifestation and the realization of it, but just that you believe you receive it. So you can believe that you receive your healing, though it has not manifested yet. And when you believe you receive it, you relax and you oh, I'm not worried about it anymore. Oh, I know that the manifestation of healing is coming, but I already believe I receive it. Anybody know? That's why I'm out here in the hallway waiting with a smile on my face. And it's like, well, where is he? He's been 45 minutes. He's not here yet. And somebody said, well, uh, you know, he's, he's probably not coming. He's, he's busy. He's probably not coming today. You, you just should go home. Ride your skateboard home. Take the bus. Ride your skateboard home. Well, if you say, no, no, he, he, he'll be here. How many of you know God's more dependable than Jerry? Amen. Amen. God's more dependable. His word is truth. But see, it's, do you believe it? Because if you believe it, you're still out there. Oh, yeah, I'm still out there. And smiling. Is that right? I'm still out there. See, I believe I receive it. So I'm out there. But it hadn't come yet, but I'm out there. See, so I don't have to convince everybody that it's already here. But I, I have to be in faith that I receive it. Because in my heart, it's a done deal. It's just the process needs to play out. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? Just the process needs to play out. So look again. Therefore, I say to you, 
New King James Version, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. When you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. And you shall have them. Now let me let Jesus say this from Matthew's Gospel, the same teaching, but from Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 21, 22, Jesus said, and whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. See how absolute that is? And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Whatever things you will receive. Whatever things you will receive. But what's the middle part? Whatever things you ask in prayer, believing. In prayer, believing. In prayer, believing. See, it says the same thing. A little different words that Matthew uses to convey, but it, it conveys the exact identical teaching. Isn't that right? Whatever things you ask in prayer, believing. When do you need to believe? In prayer. When you pray, believe right then that you receive it. And then you will have it, future. You will have it. Now, let me give you some illustrations of this in some of the other, uh, some other places. Well, let me say this first. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith and not by sight. For we walk by faith and not by sight. For we walk by faith and not by what? Sight. Sight Sight doesn't only mean vision. Sight means this world that you can see. This is what we see. This is what we hear. This is what we feel. This is what we've experienced. That's sight. We walk by faith in what God said and not on what we've experienced in this natural world. This is what this means. For we walk by faith and not by sight. And notice it's a walk of faith. A walk of faith, right? A walk of faith is not a leap of faith. I go from here to the end and it's done. No, I got to take a step. But am I taking a step that I believe it? Or am I taking a step that I'm not sure? See, because a lot of people hedge their prayers. You know what I mean by hedge your prayers? Like hedging your bet, right? You're betting that this happens. And you want a big reward. I'm not a gambler, but you're hedging, a, you're, you're betting for something big here, but you're not sure, so you're going to hedge that bet so that if it doesn't come through, you still have this. Right? A lot of people are hedging their prayers. Yeah, I'm believing that God's going to come through here, but I'm working over here just in case that doesn't come through. I got something I'm working on my own over here to take care of me. That's not faith. I said, that's not faith. No, walking by faith is I'm taking steps believing that God is faithful. He's going to come through. Amen. I heard Pastor Jonathan talking about Peter stepping out of the boat and walking on water. Isn't that right? Can you imagine Peter saying, Lord, if that's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Come. And then there he stands in the boat. And the other disciples say, what are you doing? I'm believing to walk on water. That's the way a lot of Christians talk. Well, I'm believing for this and I'm believing for that. Yeah, but you're not doing anything. There are no steps of faith whatsoever. You're just standing in the boat believing. I'm just believing. I'm believing to walk on water. I'm believing. On... Well, there's nothing you're doing to believe. You're just standing there. I'm believing to walk on water. I'm believing. They say, well, you're not walking on water. Jesus, I'm believing you to walk on water. I'm still believing you to walk on water. He said, come. I'm believing. That's the way a lot of Christians are. They just talk that like they're believing, but they're not, they don't really believe because they're not taking any steps of faith. Nothing they're doing shows that they have any faith. Amen. Why? Because they really don't believe. But Jesus said, when you pray, believe. When you pray, believe. Believe. Peter believed enough, he stepped down out of the boat, didn't he? See, that's faith. He actually started acting on his faith. He started acting on his faith. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Jesus told Thomas, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. John 20, 29. So we have to receive the answer by faith in prayer before we ever see it actually happen. We have to receive it. Jesus told that father of that epileptic boy who was demonized. He said, Mark 9, 23, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. See, Jesus is telling us that faith makes a difference. That faith makes a difference. So here's a few examples. 
in Romans 10, 9, Paul said that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you, what? You will be saved. Not might be, could be, should be. Most of the time, no. You will be saved. See how absolute? See, the, the whole Bible is congruent in the way this works. This is not just a little verse here and a little verse here. This is the way the Bible talks. This is not the way most Christians talk, but this is the way the Bible talks. You will be saved. But watch this. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Notice you're saying and believing. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be in the future saved. Now let me unpack this for you a little bit. That word believe and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That word believe it has a tense, a Greek tense that's called the aorist tense. And the aorist tense is different than the present tense in Greek. The present tense in Greek is it's happening now and continuing to happen. Like you're sitting. Yes, it's happening now, but you're continuing to sit. I'm standing. It's happening now, but I'm continuing to stand. But the aorist tense is different. The aorist tense is a point in time. It happened right then. So he's saying if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe right now when you confess that God raised him from the dead. Watch this. You will be saved. Now, why does he say will be? Aren't, aren't you born again right now? Yes, but you have to understand about salvation that salvation is not only an instant thing. See, you, you can be born again spiritually right now when you confess and believe. Yes, your spirit re, is reborn. But your mind is not saved. You have to begin with the word of God renewing your mind to the truth. Because your mind has been contaminated with the deception and lies of this world. And so we have to take the word of God and renew our minds and brainwash ourselves to believe what's real and true. Not pie in the sky, reality. And then as we do that at some point in the future, at the end of the age, we are going to be resurrected in our physical bodies like Jesus. When we see him, we will be like him. Do you remember this? We, when we see him, we will be like him. So our bodies will no longer be aging bodies with wrinkles. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Right? Aches and pains and all those things, you know, whatever is happening, you know, as you go on, you have to pray more for your body as it gets older and older and older. No, it won't be like that anymore. We'll have a resurrected body like Jesus. And that resurrected body will not be decaying, it will not be aging, it will not be subject to death anymore, it won't be corruptible, it'll be incorruptible and immoral. But see, that happens at the end of the age. So Jesus said, he who endures to the end will be saved. Okay, so salvation is progressive. It happens now, but it continues to happen, and at the end of the age it will be fulfilled. So he says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe right now, as you confess it, when you pray, that you believe you receive salvation, you will be saved. Because some of this is going to take some time to play out completely. Can everybody see that? See, this is exactly what Jesus is explaining in Mark eleven twenty four. 24. Now, let me also say this. Faith is not merely a status of the heart. It's also a decision. Faith is not merely a status of the heart. It's also a decision. It's a choice. You get to choose to believe. Well, we see it right here in this passage, verse 22. Jesus said, have faith in God. Yeah, but what if I don't? Have faith. Yeah, but what if I don't? Well, I'm telling you to. You can choose to have faith. You can choose to have faith. So faith is not merely a status of the heart, according to the word of God. Faith is also a decision. It's a choice. Let me give an example. When Jesus first began his ministry... In Mark chapter 1, the 14th verse, it says, Now after John the Baptist was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Watch this. Repent and believe in the gospel. Well, what if I don't? Well, I'm telling you to. You can choose to believe it. Have you ever told somebody, You know what? I, I, I'm just going to choose to believe you. 
They're telling something. You, I don't know whether what you're telling me is true or not. You're telling me this and that. This person did that, and I need to come over and meet somebody. You know what? Uh, you know what? I'm just going to believe you. I'm just going to believe you. you chose to believe them. You don't have all the evidence to prove it, but you chose to believe them. So you're going to go act on what they said because you're choosing, not knowing for sure, but you're choosing to believe them. And that's the way the gospel is. When the gospel of Jesus Christ comes to us in our world, you may have never heard the gospel in your life, but when you hear that there is a God who loved the world and he sent his only son to come and die for our sins and that whoever believes in him can be forgiven from their sins and have eternal life. You don't have the evidence. You don't have any experience with that. You never heard it before. You don't, you've never seen that happen before. And yet you just heard this now. You get to choose to believe beyond your experience. It's up to you. You can say, I can't prove it. I have a lot of questions in my mind. I'm, my mind is skeptical. But you know, I'm going to believe that. And when you make the decision to believe what you've heard and you begin to act on it, you'll see the power of that strike your life. Isn't that right? Paul said in Romans 8, the, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Down inside, you'll have this knowing, I'm a child of God. There's a witness of the Holy Spirit and your new born again spirit because you chose to believe the gospel, though you had no evidence to prove it. You just believe it and you chose to go with it. And now the evidence starts to come. Can you see that? You will have it. See, now the evidence starts to come. So Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. Listen to what he said in John 14, 1. You know this. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Watch this. Believe also in me. Yeah, but what if I don't? Believe it. I'm telling you to do it. See, there's a choice there. There's a choice there. Believe all, you believe in God? Believe also in me. Trust me. Trust what I say. Never heard somebody say, trust me. Trust me. You, you get to choose whether to trust people. And we get to choose whether to trust God. Let me give you another example. Elijah was saying when all the prophets of Baal and everything, they were coming up there, he's going to call fire down from heaven. In 1 Kings 18.21, Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. You get to choose. If the Lord is God, then follow what he said. Act on it. Believe it. Go with it. Even though you can't prove it. But if you believe he's God, then go with it. Right? But you have to choose. Let me give you another example. This is all over the Bible. Here's David in the Psalms. Psalm, one, Psalm 18, let me read to you the, the title of this psalm. You know, a lot of these psalms, not all of them, they have a title. And the title, by the way, is inspired. Now, some of the headings that the publishers will put on certain chapters and, and paragraphs are not inspired. That's just what the publishers added to show us different topics that are being covered. But like in these psalms, these titles are inspired. This is what David wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's included. So here's the title of Psalm 18. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies. This is longer than some psalms, I think. It goes on to say, and from the hand of Saul, and he said, and then starts the actual psalm. Okay, but watch what he says, verse 1. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust. Not just in whom I do trust, in whom I will trust. Do you see the decision? In whom I will trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Verse 3. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemy. That's a decision. That's a decision. When I get into a bind, I will call upon the Lord. I can't prove to you that he's going to come through, but I, I choose to believe him and look to him. Can you see the decision? Listen to Psalm 56. Here's the title. To the chief musician set to the silent dove in distant lands. What is he saying? Well, here's a new psalm, but this psalm is sung with the melody 
of the song, The Silent Dove in Distant Lands. So if you ever wondered what Psalm 56 sounded like, how the tune went, now you know. <laughs> it's with the melody of the silent dove in distant lands. Isn't that beautiful? Okay. <laughs> well, we don't know what it is, but back in that day, there were some people that knew that song, so they knew, ooh, that's how that melody is sung. Okay, watch this. A Mitchum of David when the Philistines captured him in Gath. It's a serious situation. Verse 1. Be merciful to me, O God, for man would swallow me up. Fighting all day, he oppresses me. My enemies would hound me all day, for there are many who fight against me, O Most High. Watch verse 3. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. Notice not I do trust in you. I will trust in you. It's a decision. It's a choice. I can either choose to trust in God and look to him, or I can choose to depend on myself or my friend, or whatever. But he said, I will trust in you. That's a decision. So faith is not merely a status of the heart. It's also a decision to believe. Aside from your questions, aside from any skepticism of your mind, you choose to say, I may not have the answers to all that, but I will believe. And by the way, the, Jesus already taught us to say to the mountain, cast down those strongholds, cast down those arguments, right? Right? All those questions, I cast you down in Jesus' name. Every argument, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, I cast you down. I don't have to answer all your questions. I believe God's word. Amen. Amen. I don't have to convince even the thoughts of my own mind. I just cast them down and say, no, I'm going to believe God. I choose to believe God. I choose to believe him. Anybody know Psalm 91? You ever heard of it? Listen to this. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him I will trust. Not in Him I do trust, in Him I will trust. I choose to put my trust in Him. Can you see that? And what's the next verse? Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. There's the power of God going into operation. See, because He chooses. All right, let me give you this example. In John chapter 4, the 46th verse, the Bible says, so Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine, and there was a certain nobleman. Everybody say nobleman. nobleman. A nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son. He's asking him, come down, come down to Capernaum and heal my son. He implored him to come down and heal his son. For he was at the point of death. It's a desperate situation. He's on his deathbed. My son's on his deathbed. Please come down to Capernaum and heal my son. Verse 48. Then Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman here a second time said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. So notice he comes a second time. Come. Come before he dies. Right? I, we appreciate the teaching and everything. But come before he dies. You can see the desperation in this father. Come before my child dies. Watch this, verse 50. Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives. Now, that's not what he asked, is it? He's asking Jesus to come and heal his son. Come before my child dies. And Jesus said, go your way, your son lives. Now, some people get this. Story confused with the centurion. You remember, a centurion came to Jesus, and he said, Lord, my servant lies at the point of death. He's paralyzed. Come and, uh, uh, and Jesus said, I will come and heal him. And he said, no, Lord, you don't need to come under my roof. Only speak a word, and my servant will be healed. So the centurion said, you don't need to come. Just say it. But this nobleman said, come. And it's his son. See, so it's not a servant, it's a son. These are distinct, right? He's saying, come. But Jesus doesn't say, I'll come. See, with the centurion, he said, I'll come. And the centurion said, you don't need to come, just speak it. With the nobleman, the nobleman said, come. But Jesus said, go your way, your son lives. Go your way, your son lives. Now watch this. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. How do we know? And he went his way. That's how we know. He didn't just say he believed. He walked by faith. 
is right. He went his way. Before he's saying, come, come. He's, he, before he dies. And she said, go your way. Your son lives. And he had to think about it, no doubt. And he decided. He made the choice. I'm going to believe it. Because if he didn't make that choice, he would still be there. Please. 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 <laughs> Please. Come. But he chose to believe what Jesus said, and he went his way. Is that right? So it says, and he, and he went his way, verse 51, and as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better, and they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour. So he'd been traveling since yesterday at the seventh hour. He was not close by Jesus. He traveled a distance to get to him. So when Jesus said, go, your son lives, that had to be faith. Because he's now got to travel a long distance. And if he's not well, then he's going to have to come all the way back. Come on, anybody see what I'm saying? No, he had to have faith. And now he's traveling. It's the next day. And they came and said, hey, your son lives. He's better. And he asked them, he inquired of them what hour he got better, and they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives, and he himself believed, and his whole household. He himself believed, and his whole household. He himself believed, and his whole household. But notice, he began to walk out his faith. He believed what Jesus said, and began to walk as if he believed what Jesus said. See, this is the big key. There are a whole lot of people that pray. They sound like faith when they pray. But then afterwards, the way you hear them talk, they're talking like it's, they didn't receive it. The way you see them walk it out, they're walking as if they don't receive it. They're not, they don't have joy. They're not grateful because in their heart, they haven't received it. But this man, oh no, he's traveling a whole day. He's still headed home in faith. In faith. And come to find out, yesterday at the seventh hour is when it actually happened. I still hadn't heard about it, still hadn't heard about it, still, still walking, still walking, still traveling, still walking, spend the night somewhere and sleep, wake up in the morning, still walking, still hadn't heard about it, hadn't heard about it, hadn't heard of it, but it's done. But he's in faith, and it was triggered when he began walking in faith. Can you see this? Oh, let me stop and say this too. Because there's, there's a little... Uh, there's a little ditch or a big one that you can get into right here. There's a ditch. Because, see, there are those folks that are in the boat. I'm believing. I'm believing for this, and I'm believing for that, and I'm believing. And they're talking big. It's easy to talk big. You learn a little bit about faith, and you, you can talk, oh, I'm believing for this, I'm believing for that, and everything. Are you? Are you really? Do you really have it inside? Or is you're saying you're believing, but it's only a hope? Jesus didn't say, when you pray, hope that you receive it. Jesus didn't say, when you pray, need to receive it. Jesus didn't say, when you pray, desire to receive it. Jesus said, when you pray, believe that you receive them. Isn't that right? Believe. And there's a difference. But here's a ditch. Sometimes, having learned some of this, then we get our minds around people around us. And we start thinking about how people perceive us. Do people perceive me as a man of faith, a woman of faith? Do they esteem me as somebody who has an in with God or is getting things done? How do they esteem me? So now we're over here saying something in faith. Well, I believe God this, and I believe that, and we're saying that. But what's on our mind, what's in our hearts is how we're perceived by people talking like that. Or... We're stepping, well, I'm walking in faith, I'm just doing this, and we're taking steps. But what's really on our mind is not believing God, but how are people going to perceive me if I do this? And let me just tell you, not only is there no benefit in the kingdom of God to that, but the kingdom has adverse effects. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. The proverb says, James and Peter both tell us, quoting from the Old Testament, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Yes. Isn't that right? James, the brother of Jesus, also said, where envy and self-seeking exist, 
there's confusion in every evil thing there. Isn't that right? So see, we're going through these actions, talking something that sounds like faith, walking something that looks like faith, but because of the motive of the heart and what's really on our minds, it is counterproductive in the spirit realm. That is not the kingdom. And the Bible says in Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents, the motives of the heart. Oh, and the word of God comes in and saying, that's not faith, that's pride, that's self-seeking. You're trying to get people to look at you and esteem you. That is not faith. That's not faith. That's self-seeking. And that's not what triggers the power of God. But can you see how it looks like it, sounds like it? Somebody said, well, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it is a duck. That, that's not always true. That's a fake duck. That's a fake duck. Isn't that right? That's a toy duck, but that's not a real duck. Is that right? And thank God the Word of God teaches us these things. Teaches us these things. So you know what you do? You do what Jesus has already taught us to do. When you perceive that and the word of God inside of you, the, the light of the word, the entrance of his word gives light. The spirit of the man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart. And when your spirit, by the light of God's word, brightens that up and sees that pride, that self-seeking, you open your mouth and say, no, I cast you down, you pride I repent of that. I will not think that. I will not try to impress people. No, this is not about that. This is not about what anybody thinks about me, how I look in front of everybody, whether I look spiritual or whether I look knowledgeable. No, I cast you down in Jesus' name. You thought I bring you captive. Isn't that what the Bible's already taught us? Didn't we already go over all this? Yes, you cast that down. Why? Because that will be a mountain of hindrance to your faith in receiving the supernatural answer. You address that. You confront that. You cast down that pride. No, no, no. No, no. Cleanse me of that, Lord, in Jesus' name. I confess that as wrong thinking. That's wrong. That's, that's disobedient. No, Lord. I need you to come through here, and I believe you to come through, not to look good. Do you see the difference? See the difference? That's why we've got to let the sharp sword of the word divide these things so that we don't mush them all together and wonder why we're not having success and results. This is why Jesus is saying, if you listen to me, your prayers will be answered. But you need to listen to me. So just with what we've been learning from Mark 11, 23 and 22 and how the Lord's been applying that, we can see, oh my goodness, we can pick all these things off that are the ditches and stay right on the road to get our prayers answered. Can you see that? Oh, don't you love God's word? Yes. Now, Jesus' brother, Jesus' brother. You know, Jesus had four brothers, right? Uh, by the way, did you know Jesus was the oldest? Let me help you with that. If you were born of a virgin, you're the oldest. Is that right? <laughs> He's the oldest, okay? But he had four brothers. The eldest brother... Uh, uh, after Jesus is James, who wrote the book of James in the New Testament, who was also, he also became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. It was his brother. And James told us, he said, faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. So James is telling us the same thing. This nobleman, he started walking, it happened the same hour. It didn't say it happened the same moment. It said it happened the same hour. We don't know how far in that walk he got before it triggered the release of the power of God. Amen. But James says, this is the way it works, guys. This is just like my brother told you. Faith without works is dead. You believe you receive it to the point that you're acting as if you receive it. You're walking, talking as if not to impress, but because you believe it, you chose to believe it. And you're walking, you're standing out there in the hallway waiting for me to show up with the keys to your car. You chose to stay when everybody else says, oh, you know, he jokes a lot. He was joking. He jokes a lot. No, he, he, he was just messing with you. No, go home. 
And you say, no, I, I'm staying. See, you choose to stay. You choose to believe. This is what Jesus is saying. Believe that you receive it, and you will have it. I remember back in 2007, uh, you remember the big financial crisis that happened in 2008? Well, now we know, you know, we learned afterwards that that, that was coming on in 2007. It was already beginning to, un, you know, to unfold, and then bam, it eventually hit and rocked the world, actually, in 2008. But in 2007, the fall of 2007, September, October, November. And September, you know, any business, any organization, any ministry, you know, you project the income that's coming in and you project your expenses, and that's called a budget. So we had our budget, but guess what? In September, uh, the actual income for September was over $100,000 less than the projected income. Over a hundred grand. Like that's missing it. And it wasn't just because we were not, you know, good projectors. We were watching the trajectory and the and the trend of everything. And we were just projecting. We weren't trying to be unreasonable. But over a hundred thousand dollars lower? We didn't know what what you know, sometimes something happens, but that's significant. And if that wasn't bad enough, it happened again the next month. And you know, you've already projected your budget, given budgets to all the departments and everybody out there, missionaries and everything. Well, it's all being spent, but it didn't come in. We projected so much to come in, so much to be spent. Well, so much is spent, but so much didn't come in. And if that wasn't bad enough, it happened the third month. Three months in a row. Three months in a row, over $100,000 less than what we budgeted. Now what do you do? Now what do you do? So we get, got in a meeting. Pastor Carl was in that meeting. And we were talking about this and say, okay, well, let's look at it. Oh, man, third month in a row here. And we were right at the end there of November. And we could see, oh, man, the, the income you can track more quickly than the expenses. The income we know. We count. We know what comes in. But it takes, it takes you know, a little bit longer to get all those expenses calculated and everything before you know where that came in. But the income... We got to the end of November. We know where that is, and we're like, mm, that's the third month, 100 grand off. Well, that'll deplete your reserves quick. I mean, and, and we just talked about it and said, you know, if we have another month like that, we'll be in the red. Now, up until that point, all our bills are paid. We weren't in the red. Everything's up to date. Everything's paid. But if one more of those happen, we'll be in the red. We won't be able to pay everything. And so our treasurer, our finance pastor, he brought up, he said, hey, we, we need to make a decision because we're, we're supposed to now give Christmas bonuses to the staff. And we didn't want to wait until later. We want to do it early so that if they want to use it for Christmas shopping or whatever. And so we said, we need to make this decision. Well, to some people, they just look and look at the trajectory and say, oh, yeah, that, that's off the table already because look, the numbers, that, the numbers lead us. And, that, and I guess that'd be true for somebody that doesn't have a God. But we have a God. So, so we said, well, let's stop and pray because it could be that the Lord's saying, hey, there, there's a financial crisis brewing. It's time to tighten the belt. I want you to eliminate all unnecessary expenses because sometimes the Lord will lead you like that. Isn't that right? God will lead like that. And so... So we wanted to know, what do you do? James 1.5 says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given. So we just stopped and said, let's pray. So we began to pray. I stood up from my chair, as I often do, and I began to walk, pray. We're praying in the Spirit, saying, Lord, give us wisdom. What are you saying? And just a few minutes of prayer, and something came up in my spirit. And this is what came up. We have no evidence whatsoever that God will not provide all of our needs in December, including for the Christmas bonus. We have no evidence that God will not provide everything we need in December, including the Christmas bonus. These three months, that is not evidence that God won't provide for us. That just came up in my spirit. We have no evidence that God... See, up until that time, all our bills are paid. Now, we may have drained our reserve, but all our bills are paid. What we actually had to have, we have. We have no evidence. I came back and told the team, I said, let me tell you what, just is coming to me in my heart. 
We have no evidence whatsoever that God, our God, will not supply all of our needs for December, including the, the Christmas bonuses for the staff. By the way, a staff who works tirelessly and gets paid less than what they could be paid out in the secular world, they do this as a ministry to the Lord. So you don't want to miss those opportunities to bless them. And so we all talked about it and prayed about it. We came into agreement. Oh, Lord, we thank you. Though, we, though the projection was missed the last three months, we thank you. You are our God. You'll supply the need in December, including the Christmas bonuses in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said, if two or three of you ask, then Father will do it. Didn't he say that? So we just took him at his word. We pulled the trigger. Do the Christmas bonuses. Yeah. Now that's easy to say, but then you got to see what's going to happen. Is that right? Because we already acknowledge, even without Christmas bonuses, if we have another month like the last three months, we're already in deficit, and then the Christmas bonuses add to it. Do you hear what I'm saying? But thank God his word is truth, and we didn't end up in deficit. In fact, not when, we, when the smoke settled and the dust cleared from December, all of the bills of December were paid, all of the Christmas bonus were paid, and we had an extra overflow of $50,000 to begin replenishing the reserves. Amen. Amen. Our cup ran over. Amen. See, we got to not follow what we see and follow the Lord, but it has to be faith. And we take steps. Is that right? And we take steps. Let me wrap this up. Luke 17, listen to this. Now it happened as Jesus went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him 10 men who were lepers. How many? 10. 10 men who were lepers. Leprosy, a disease of the skin that starts eating away at your skin. It's active. It's sort of like skin cancer, and it starts eating away. And if, and if you don't watch it, it'll eat away your body parts. It'll eat away things in your body. But it can go into remission. Okay, And he said there were 10 men who were lepers who stood afar off. Why? Because they weren't allowed to come into society. They couldn't live at home anymore with their families. They had to live out in a leper colony. So that's why they're standing afar off. And they lifted up their voices, all 10 of them, and said, Jesus, Master. Evidently, they discussed this. And they came, and they got as close as they could. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. What are they saying? We hear about you healing other people. <laughs> Heal us. Have mercy on us. Why? We don't deserve it. But have mercy on us. Yeah. We can't go home. We can't live in society. Have mercy on us. We lost our lives. See, people are in just as serious situations as they are today. And watch this, verse 14. So when he saw them, he said to them, how many of them were there? Ten. ten. He said to all ten. He said to them, go show yourselves to the priests. I'll bet that's not what they expected. They're asking to be healed. And he yelled back, go show yourselves to the priests. Now, why would he say that? He said that because... In the Old Testament law of Leviticus, the Bible talks specifically about leprosy. And it said that if you were a leper, but you believe that your leprosy has gone into remission and you're, you're on the mend and it's being healed, you can go to a priest and God in Leviticus tells the priest exactly what to look for to see if it's still an active leprosy or if it's one that's in remission and it's being healed. And God, I mean, gets into specifics. Black hair, white hair or yellow hair, white scab. And I mean, gets in. it's kind of gross, but God explains exactly how they know and what to do to assure that they're on the men so that they can come back into society. And so when Jesus said, and, but the priest had to do it. You couldn't self-assess. You had to go to the priest and the priest did it according to the scripture. So when Jesus said, go show yourselves to the priests, He's telling them, you believe that you're healed and you're going to go to the priest and they're going to verify it according to scripture. And they knew that. They knew what he was saying. You know, they could have stood there and said, 
As soon as you heal us, we'll go. But Lord, we have leprosy. We can't go right now. But if you'll heal us, they could have stood there and negotiated, explained their situation, not acted, because they didn't yet believe that they received it. But Jesus said, go show yourselves to the priests. And look at this. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. As they went, they were cleansed. As they went, why are we even going? We believe that if we follow what he said, that somehow we don't know how we've never heard of this happening with anybody before, but let's go. Let's go show the priests. And so it was that as they went, you know, this is where a lot of people miss it right then. They didn't believe they received and they didn't do anything. They didn't go. They didn't act on it. They just stayed in the boat. I'm believing, I'm believing, I'm believing. But, but they really don't believe. There's no action whatsoever. But notice, so it was as they went, they were cleansed. As they went in faith. As they went in faith. Didn't say they saw any change. No, as they went, they were cleansed. There was no cleanse until they were cleansed. As they went, they were cleansed. As they went, they were cleansed. Can you see that? Believe that you receive them and you will have them. They did have it in the future. Sometime between the time they started walking toward the priests and the time they got to the priest, the power of God healed them and cleansed them. Their faith of going triggered the power from heaven to cleanse their bodies. Is that right? That's what happened. See, sometimes we just get simplistic and we say, oh yeah, Jesus just healed people. Yeah, but read the stories. It wasn't only Jesus. They were acting in faith too. Sometimes it was Jesus only, but usually he's preaching to them and they have to believe and they have to come or they have to receive. He puts mud on the blind man's eyes and said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. You think? After you smear mud all over my face, you think? <laughs> but the man had to believe to go and do it, and he came back seen. You see that? We need to read the stories and look. It's not just Jesus saying something and it instantly happens. He's calling on people, believe, believe. Now watch this. This is powerful. You ready for this? As they went, they were cleansed, verse 15. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned, and with a loud voice, oh, can't you hear him? With a loud voice. Can't you just hear him? <laughs> he didn't care who's listening. I don't care who's listening. With a loud voice. He glorified God. He's so happy. My life just got restored. I don't care who's listening to me with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Now watch this. So Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Did Jesus see the other nine cleansed? No, they're, they're going to the priests. Or they're, they're, they've gone to the priest and they're with their families. See, only one returned. The other nine are not here. But what did Jesus say? Were there not ten cleansed? Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Who told him there were ten cleansed? Nobody. So what is he saying? Were there not ten cleansed? What is he saying? When I spoke it, I believed when I spoke it. So where are the nine? It could have been that half of the ten, five went and five didn't go. And five got cleansed and five didn't. But notice where Jesus stands. Were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? I spoke in faith and believed for all ten to be cleansed. Where are the nine? What does this teach us? This teaches us that when God speaks promises, he believes when he speaks them for you to receive it. And he's asking you, will you believe? I believe it. Will you believe it? 
I believe it when I spoke it. I believe for you to receive. Will you believe that you receive it? I believe it. I believe it. Even if I don't see everybody come back, I believe for all 10. I believe for all 10. Everyone, notice, nobody left out. Nobody left out. Nobody left out. Amen? The Lord's telling us, I gave these promises to you, and when I spoke them, I believe them. Will you believe them? I'm believing them. Will you believe them? Will you be in agreement with me and believe what sounds too good to be true? Will you believe it? Would you believe it? Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? Were there not any who found, were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith, your faith has made you well. Notice, yeah, it was Jesus that gave the command, go show yourselves to the priest. But notice he clarified it, but it was your faith that triggered it to happen. Can you see that? Therefore, I say unto you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Believe that you receive them. Believe that you receive them. You believe. I already believe God's saying. You believe that you receive them and you will have them. Why? Because you're in agreement with me and us together. I'll release it if you'll believe it. I'll release it if you believe it. Amen. Can you see that? I'll release it if you believe it. So how do, so how do you do it? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Notice double. Faith comes by hearing, I'm pointing to my ear, and hearing, I'm pointing to my heart. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Jesus said in another place, hearing they do not hear. Hearing they do not hear. They hear with their ears, but they're not hearing me with their heart. See, so it's not just hearing the Bible. I don't care how good looking the pastor is that preaches to you or whoever the teacher is. Or just you hearing the scriptures being read straight. I don't care how good the narrator's voice is. But are you hearing God say it to you? Not just hearing the Bible with your physical ears, but are you hearing in your heart that God, when he spoke this, has faith for you to receive it? Now, let me tell you, he does whether you hear it or not. But when you hear it down in your heart, oh, he's saying it to me. I remember when it happened. With the righteousness of God in Christ, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. And when I saw in the scriptures and I heard that God was saying that to me, that you who struggling with the bondage of lust are the righteousness of God in him because he took your sin and your lust and your bondage and died with it, and gave you the free gift of his righteousness, and you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Oh, it was true for me all along. But when I heard it inside, that God believed it for me, oh, 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 inside, I believe it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But my mind said, but you're still struggling with these things. But I had to choose, no. I'm not arguing with you. I cast you down. I don't care if I'm still struggling with these things. God said, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ, so therefore I am. You see? And guess what? That faith of receiving it triggered the power of God to break the bondage over my life and to set me free. Praise God. Can you see that? So what do you do? You have to hear. But not just here. Don't just go through your Bible reading. Get it done. Get it done. Get it done. Uh 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 uh. Mm mm. No no no. Listen. He's talking to you through the Word. He's talking. You know we ought to start doing. We ought to start lifting our Bibles and say, "This is my Bible. It's God speaking to me." Maybe we should start doing that. Oh yeah, we do do that. Why? And this is why we do. We have to know it's not to check a box off to get it done. We need to hear him because when you hear him, you're changed. When you hear him, he convinces you. And then you still have thoughts in your mind, but you choose. No, I believe him. That's the way it is. That's the way it is. Amen? That's the way it is. Thank God. Thank God. That woman... With the flow of blood, you remember it says, when she heard about Jesus, when she heard about Jesus, she said within herself, made the decision, 
If I can but touch his clothes, I'll be made well. She made the decision. If I can but touch his clothes, I will be made well. And she got in there where she shouldn't have been because she was unclean. She's bleeding. Apparently her menstrual cycle just wouldn't stop. And she's supposed to stay away from everybody. But she said, oh, if I can get a hold of his clothes, then I won't be against the law anymore. I won't be breaking the law anymore. And she got a hold of him. Man, power came out from him. This is what Jesus is saying. It's available to you. Don't think you're disqualified. You're not disqualified. I know Father God. He wants to answer your prayer. But believe you receive it when you pray. And you will have it. Amen. Thank God. Thank God. God is good, isn't he? Oh, man, I don't know about you, but I could feel the water level of faith rising in this room. Amen. Anybody have prayers you want to pray? Let's, let's stand together, can we? Thank God. I want us to do something. Let's, let's lift up our two hands to the Lord, can we? Oh, he deserves the praise. Let's lift up one hand, thanking him for all the things that he has already done. But let's lift up another hand, thanking him for all the things that he's going to do, he's about to do. Amen? All the prayers he's about to answer. Oh, all the power of God that will be triggered. Glory to God that will be released on our behalf because we're not ordinary people. Oh, we're the people of the living God. Praise God. We're the body of Christ, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Praise God. Thank him for his promises. Thank him for his faithfulness. Go ahead, lift your voice, thank him. Oh, give him glory today. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you for your word. Thank him for teaching you. Oh, Jesus, thank you for teaching us. Thank you for teaching us. Oh, the nuances, the details, the intricacies of how this works. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Let's say some things together. Just say it out loud. Father God, thank you for sending Jesus not only to die for us, to save us, but also to teach us your ways, how things work. I receive the word of God. I receive your perspective as absolute truth. I trust you. I believe you in the name of Jesus. And I thank you that going forward, my prayers will be answered. Jesus is right. I believe him. Jesus is right. So therefore, things are looking up for me. Things are looking up for me. God is on my side. I'm not like everybody else. I'm a child of the living God. I have access to the throne room of God. And my prayers get answered. My prayers get answered. Lord, forgive all of my sins. Wash me in your blood. And I thank you that you will answer my prayers. In Jesus' name. And if you agree with that, would you say amen? Can we clap our hands in agreement today?